Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 688. That is 688 of the Agostino Zynga show and I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. How am I? All things are good, all things considered, I cannot lie. Um, the weekend has been a far, it's, it's a memory far in my past now. So there's no point updating you on that in kind of intrinsic detail, but I did get a chance to go to Pirate Studios with, with a friend and have a good fun there. Ended up having a bit of a sesh, getting down in the, in the DJ rooms. And quite quickly, after a session in there, I quickly realized why I should be going in there more often. I know I say a lot on here. I should be doing monthly mixes. I should be turning that place into my kind of dojo, my sanctuary where I go and play and have fun. But sometimes the price just doesn't permit because it's so expensive compared to what I pay for nights out that it just doesn't make it seem you know worthwhile but after this session I can honestly say I had a lot more fun being in Pirate Studios than I've ever had going to a nightclub in a very long time maybe in the last year or so I can honestly say that um, be able to play music that you've been digging all week to kind of play thinking of you know combos that could work um back to going back to back with a friend and stuff being in a close proximity the, the noise bouncing off the walls drinking having a good time it's always a good vibe in there in Paris so i have to really really be honest and they've got loads of locations all over london all essentially self-service no need to talk to anybody no need to get in conversation with strangers um usually in areas that you can get home easily bloody blah 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 loads of benefits but for some reason i just can't make the decision to kind of cut out some other expenses that i have in order to kind of pour my money into that more so and um, maybe long term what i probably should be doing obviously is getting my own studio buying a proper setup myself then maybe able to play there whenever i want but for the time being there should be an ability there should be an understanding a desire a requirement from me especially seeing as i'm quote unquote up and coming tj and i love the scene and i love the music i should be going in there and playing every single month if not more to practice um just to kind of fuck around and have some fun and whatnot because it honestly is a blast so big up pirate studios and what they do there i just wish the prices for the dj rooms were a bit cheaper especially if you're going to do like seven hours and stuff i wish they made it cheaper i know they've got cheaper rooms you could do that sort of stuff in the studio rooms you could go there for seven hours for like i think 50 pound or something which is pretty good but i wish they would do a similar deal with the dj studio room so if you want to go in and have like a long session really practice and really do like a long just you know berlin style and um, dj set where you play a really expansive set taking your listeners or viewers on a journey that should be one price um regardless if you go over time and do it off peak because sometimes when you try and book a room there off peak after 12 the prices are insane like i think like a one hour price is like i don't know 50 pounds or something and you know it goes up to insane prices for an hour of time in those sort of studios so it can get really annoying really really quickly but had a lot of fun so big up pirate and if you're out if you are considering going to pirate make sure you use my flipping um referral code i'll put it down below in the description if you want to check it out it definitely is one of the better places to go to if you want to record music if you want to dance if you want to dj um if you just want to mess around in the studio with you know sound installation and do your thing i remember one time i used to stream there too i streamed a couple ufc fight cars there i made it a couple patreon episodes there so it definitely is a versatile place to go check out so if you haven't make sure you do go and check it out over there but i have to start off this pod actually unfortunately with some sad news um over the last couple of days it's been confirmed now by various sources and by the brand itself that span to also known as chris print up one of the co-founders of the legendary streetwear label or brand born and raised unfortunately passed away um really 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 tragic news um can't really go past how tragic it is especially when you consider the guy's journey um especially consider the fact that he basically overcame um you know stuff like flipping addiction you know things like you know cancer 
um, growing up in a rough part of town, growing up in a single parent household, all that malarkey. And essentially he kind of, you know, pulled himself up by his bootstraps in a, you know, in, in, in a conventional sense and made a life for himself and bettered himself and his family's life with the power of streetwear, which is absolutely incredible. And I remember him more so because there was a period of time where I felt like in streetwear, it kind of shifted where all the streetwear guys suddenly wanted the approval of the fashion people, which is odd because fashion people were never going to approve streetwear. They kind of put up with it because for some reason, fashion and streetwear kind of had this really interesting, um, you know, there was a confluence happening, right? Where they kind of both kind of met each other at the same sort of time. And loads of brands on the runway were adopting, you know, key streetwear pieces like hoodies, jeans, and all those things like into their runway pieces. So naturally, those sort of brands became a little bit more prominent. But in terms of accepting the industry, they never would. And, um, but they, you know, still streetwear guys pursued and kept at trying to get their approval. Then, of course, all the menswear stores and buyers and whatnot shifted their buying and whatnot to Paris Fashion Week men's. So that became like a thing and it's still a thing now to this day where a lot of streetwear stores, menswear stores will go and set up studios and whatnot and um, in Paris during Paris Men's Fashion Week. And a lot of brands basically try their best to bend over backwards and appease those people and change their brand and what they do. I feel like born and raised always kept true to what they are never i felt like chased the fashion cloud even though a lot of people tried to bring them on board um or were chasing them and just kept plugging away doing their own thing and kind of tragically as you know towards the end of his quote-unquote life before he even knew he was going to pass away it seemed like everything was starting to finally click for spantu with born and raised like the collaborations were going up and leveling up you know with the levi's the nike sbs about to come out and these were you know one of the better nike sb um dunk lows we've seen in a very long time in terms of what he'd been able to do in the colorway and how he's able to design that shoe and re you know basically reimagine a dunk something that's been a little bit overused in the last few years and it felt like they were about to hit another level. And then just as they're about to hit another level, just as they're about to hit another level, tragedy strikes and he passes away. And it's really, really sad to be fair. I'm not going to lie because I can only imagine what his family and friends are kind of going through because he was always very family orientated, um, always kind of pushed the brand in terms of being an avenue and an ability for him to look after his family, to pay them back for all the years he put them through of grief, growing up graffiti and getting arrested, all this malarkey, right? And he kind of used the brand as a way to kind of, hey, here's my, here's my way of essentially rewriting the legacy of my family and providing my kids and their kids a platform for them to kind of, you know, be so financially stable, to self to be self self-sufficient and all this stuff going forward and it's just a real shame that he didn't get a chance to kind of see out that entire vision he just got a chance to set it up and to kind of lay the groundwork and the blueprint for it but he didn't get a chance to really see how he kind of deserved to have that to be fair but let's read the article this is courtesy of born and raised courtesy of um sorry hype beast it says born and raised co-founder chris Panto print up has reportedly died um because Chris Banter Chris have probably died at the moment. Details of his death have not yet been confirmed. There's a report that he died on Tuesday evening. Many of his close friends and colleagues in the industry have began paying tribute, including Ben Bola. The designer started a brand um, with Alex Two-Tone Erdman a decade ago as an ode to Venice Beach, California. Since starting the brand, Born and Race has found itself collaborating with some of the biggest franchises that come out of Los Angeles, the Lakers, the Dodgers, the Kings, the Rams, and even Los Angeles FC, the football team. The labels also joined forces with collabs with the likes of New Era and Converse. Just recently, the designer took to Instagram to share and to take a look back on his life and express how grateful he had been to be cancer free. And this is a really, really poignant post because I remember it popping across my flipping timeline of him basically reflecting on how far he's come. And he looks absolutely incredible in this picture with this amazing suit. Um, you know, great picture taken in front of this red, red kind of velvet curtains. And you read this amazing paragraph basically explaining how far he's kind of come from, you you know the early days and what he kind of went through to get to this point and it was a real rousing speech that you know gave me a lot of kind of motivation i'm sure probably put a tear in a lot of people's eyes so it's pretty tragic to kind of read this back and think you know what happened since then so let's read the post anyway it says i just want to take a moment to take a long hard look back what was happened what was sorry, i just want to take a moment <clears throat> i just want to take a moment to take a long hard look back what was happened I just want to take a moment to take a long, hard look back. What's happened over the last 10 years? I think if you would have taken a peek at my Instagram and seen the highlight reel, you'd think it might have been easy. 
But for where I've started, like in the early years of my life, growing up, my dad was homeless. My mom was mentally ill. I spent a lot of my time in and out of the system from an early age, from Central Juvenile Hall to many years spent in the county. I decided I cre to create a clothing brand while in the last time I was incarcerated. I cooked up and um, born and raised while I was, I was in the hole at the Supermax. I don't know if anyone who's reading this has been there, but if you have ever eaten juke balls for a month, you know the deal. Juke balls don't sound fun. They don't sound like, you know, Swedish meatballs from flipping Ikea. Let's just say that. So this guy's definitely been through it. A couple of years after working on Born and Raised, we started moving. Things were great. One month after we launched with Union, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Yes, terminal. So from 2013 until now, I've been battling cancer, did four years of chemo, lost 100 pounds of my hair and numerous times. And this explains a lot why I felt like Born and Raised disappeared. Around that time, 2013, 2014, 2015, I like, where did they go? And they dropped the odd thing here and there, but it didn't feel like they were a presence as much on social media. And obviously, you know, um, Spanty was a big part of it because he was very forward facing in terms of, yeah, this is my brand type of thing. Bloody hell, man. Anyway, let's continue. Um, what I'm getting at is life is hard for everyone. And I want everyone to know that if you're feeling discouraged and you feel like your life, you've, you've given too many handicaps, it's okay. You're going to be fine. Things will get better. I'm cancer free. I'm not incarcerated and my family has a house to live in. And I want to look back at all this has happened and say thank you. Because just five years ago, I was in the worst place of my life. I've, ne I've ever been. And just this last week, I've been, I've been in Vogue, New York Times and a bunch of other places that I'm extremely grateful for. If you would have told me 10 years ago that I would have been hosting a dinner with Nike on the roof of the Soho house for 100 of my friends, I would have never believed you. So again, I want to look back at all the beautiful gifts i've been given and enjoy it all thank you so much to so house california nike you thanks a few other people on here and also i want to thank my beautiful wife anna for supporting me and another person called carlos for taking this beautiful photo of me and i have a lot to be thankful for this year so it's nice that he was thankful for everything that he received it was also great to see he also received these flowers during this time i felt like he got a lot of recognition a lot of kind of you know um highlights he was on a few podcasts i saw pop up on my feed and whatnot and he was able to tell his story in his own words so that's somewhat comforting but i just feel like it's so eerie how these things happen where towards the end of these like super creative lives you look at people like Roger Abloh most recently they come they, they kind of go into flipping soup overdrive in terms of the amount of output they you know in terms of the amount of creatively in terms of the amount of things that they create right in terms of output they go in absolute overdrive um you look at virgil's life towards the end he was going crazy with the collabs crazy with the collections um and then you look at flipping span to obviously or born and raised how he upped the levels really in a big way with his brand and was really starting to lay some foundations to go into the next 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 level and it kind of got cut all tragically short due to him passing away the way he did and it's even more tragic because you know the guy survived cancer you know what i mean he survived cancer Center. he survived growing up in the mean streets of venice he survived everything else that was thrown at him and then he has to die you know allegedly in some sort of car crash and i think if what makes it even worse if i'm not mistaken knowing his history i think his dad might have passed away from the same thing if i'm not mistaken i think his dad may have passed away from the same thing if i'm not mistaken um but yeah man this is crazy so let's read the article the, the, the post courtesy of born and raised official instagram account it says spanty was in a car accident on june 25th he passed away at 7 56 a.m local time june 28th in albuquerque new mexico so he's he was in hospital for a long time after the accident trying to fight it which explains why a lot of people on social media were saying to people not to post the rip um you know too quickly because i felt i think a lot of people were hoping that he'd pull through so he must have been on flipping life support or just in pain or just hanging on for dear life and unfortunately he couldn't but damn man. um he leaves behind his wife anna and three children marilyn carter and david a sister three brothers his mother stepmother and stepfather and his beloved grandparents his family are born and raised his extended native family the city of los angeles and the loved um and championed and extensive network of true friends love um alex two-tone born and raised 
can't, can't anyway words can't describe how terrible that is to see to be fair um r.i.p um span two from born and raised but again another reminder for me and myself like you know and others out there especially other creators um you know because we i think we all kind of suffer from you know flipping procrastination and self-doubt and stuff like it's really important to get out your vision um because you're never really sure how long you have on this flipping spinning ball hurling through space there is no guarantee that you're ever going to see tomorrow for any of us in any way shape or form and it is important if you've been bestowed gifts and talents to really put it out and express yourself because you never know who this stuff can touch that's one of the kind of somewhat comforting things about this whole thing right alex has been able to you know i'm sorry um span to be able to put together a pretty sick cup brand with a really clear vision um you know he's basically the venice beach champion and um, he speaks about venice more enthusiastically than anyone i know on social media or in internet overall the only person i can think of who speaks as highly about venice beach is maybe toke um pot lord from flipping no jump extended family who's also part of like what's it called biggest bros but he's also championing his area, championing his family, user brands and avenue to kind of take his family out from the depths of poverty. All this amazing stuff that he's able to do, um, I think is an inspiration for everybody else going forward that, hey, you can also do this as well in your own way. And that's maybe the somewhat comforting thing of it, that he was able to put out his gifts, put out his talent, showcase them and inspire people to do their own version of what he'd been able to do. So if you're not doing that, then you're obviously not going to be able to impact people soon after you've passed. So that's something that has been on my mind. There's something that I've also felt about, you know, ever since kind of Virgil passed about, you know, the lasting kind of influence and legacy that he kind of left um, in the time that he was around and how much he got done in that very short concentrated space of time. So um, RIP to Span 2. Again, um, thoughts and feelings go out to all his close family and friends. I cannot imagine what they're going through. It must be an absolutely tragic, tragic time. And, yeah i can only just hope that they get some sort of comfort from knowing that the guy did it you know what i mean he set out he set out to do what you know he set, he set out what he wanted to do he did it in the best way possible he shined amazingly bright and he was able to kind of touch many people with the power of streetwear with the power of fashion with the power of community and now um his legacy will live far 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 beyond the year that he was basically on this earth so that might be some comfort to it regardless but again sending prayers and strength to his entire family man i can't imagine what they're going through i really 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 cannot then to move on from that one i'm quickly going to touch upon this because i thought this was really interesting um I recently kind of stumbled across a page on Instagram because I don't really browse my Instagram too much because I'm usually on Twitter mostly. That's mostly my um, main source of social media kind of content that I'm kind of consuming. And I don't really tend to check people's stories and stuff on Instagram. So I don't really know what people are up to. But one day I did and I stumbled across a loosely associated friend, colleague, you know, hangout scene person who had eventually got married, right? Really nice wedding. It looks amazing. Everything looked great. But I did remember at the time when I was checking it, like I had these weird feelings because I remember thinking, rah, it's interesting that I haven't seen these people in a long time. I don't speak to them like that anymore. I don't really know nothing about them. I don't even know the name of this guy's wife or his girlfriend or fiance at the time. I didn't even know he was getting married at the time. But yeah, I still feel like I should have been invited. And it was a really strange kind of feeling to kind of process that kind of, you know, um, feeling like you've been left out, but then also knowing that even if you did get invited, you would have never gone because that's the whole reason why I didn't get invited because over a long period of time of us being kind of seen friends, I never really once made the effort to kind of take the relationship to the next level. I never cultivated a relationship. Maybe it was never on anyway. That's the one thing also I have to count. I can't always, always say I'm the most amazing person to hang out with. Maybe it was never on the cards, but I never tried to pursue it. So I can't be surprised when somebody says, you know what, I'm not going to invite you because we're not that close really. So I, don't, I didn't really take it too personally, but I still felt like I should have been invited. It's a very, very strange feeling to kind of process in your head. Anyway, one thing that I did realize actually was that, and I think this is a message I need to kind of put out there to all my maybe younger listeners out there. If you're like me, like in terms of personality wise, you're like a bit of a loner. You don't like having groups of friends around you. You don't really like hanging out with people like that. Um, you see friendships as maybe like uh, something that might hold you back from trying to achieve your dream, which is awful to say that, but maybe that's how I've always been in terms of very selfish with my time and what I do and stuff. And you find it hard to compromise, find it hard to fucking meet people in the middle, whatever it may be, right? If you've got that kind of personality that I have, then I think you have to accept that in life, the older you get, 
you're going to reach these milestones where you're going to have a clear representation, identification, example as to what damage that kind of outlook and approach to life can do. And I think the years that I've spent being the loner, being the lone wolf, doing things on my own, not needing a crew, not needing a click, being very independent. I think in my head, that's what I was doing. But I'm sure in other people's heads, it looked like I came across arrogant. I came across like I knew everything. I came across like I had a big ego. I came across whatever, right? And because of that, it can maybe set people off the wrong way. It can maybe make them feel a bit aggrieved. So I can understand where they're coming from in that regard. So you have to accept if you are going to be that person that's a, like I would like to describe myself as an extrovert introvert, that you have to accept that sometime along the line of your life, some people that you count as friends will not include you in things like weddings, like invited to funerals, like invited to baby showers, because you're not really a part of their life like that anymore. You know, you know what I mean? Like it just moves on and you have to kind of be okay with it because you've decided from that early age, like I did, that you're not going to be the friend guy. You're going to just be on your own. You're going to see them when you see them and that's it. And I have to kind of eat that and accept that. Um, And I think it's perfectly okay to maybe feel a little bit aggrieved that you should be invited. I think everyone has that sort of feeling, but it's just an interesting feeling to have, like, because it kind of feels a little bit entitled also it kind of feels a little bit selfish right like you don't want to do what friends do to cultivate and keep relationships but then you also want what friends get like the rewards of being a friend of somebody is you get invited to stuff right you get considered for things um you get included in things um and you know clearly i've never done that over my life so i shouldn't be surprised when people decide hey let's put that guy over there we don't want him in our crew it's okay um which is perfectly fine again like i said because this group of people you know as much as it was cool to hang out with them when we were all younger it was never really going to go any further than that in it because you know some of them you know not, wasn't really fond of anywhere to begin with it was always a bit odd a little bit you know twitchy and stuff in terms of communication um so that was never going to kind of go anywhere in, in time soon and i'm not really somebody to kind of you know, even try and act like I'm bothered or speak about things that bother me. So I'd just rather just not talk to you. So I guess that kind of doesn't help in terms of, you know, resolving issues. So maybe some things were lingering and then when you're not talking to somebody, they make their own mind up about what you're not talking to them. And then suddenly time happens, you know, loss of communication. And then in that, in that in between time, people just make up their own narrative about why they're not talking to you where they are. And it's just, you know, it becomes what it is. So you have to be okay with it. But I've, I think I've decided quite, you know, a few years ago, I think I came to a realization that every action that I do for the most part, when it comes to communicating with people, it's always going to have a reaction or a consequence and I'm okay to live with it like long-term always okay with it. So even if it's like a late night DM or like some comment that I make or like a joke that I sent out, I'm always okay with it. And you have to be perfectly okay with that in your head. So the next time you reject somebody's invite to go to their birthday party, you don't want to pull up to go to some festival. You don't want to go to some concerts, some dinner, just know it's going to have some, um, ramifying effects down the line somewhere um, and it's going to manifest maybe in you checking the Instagram and finding out that one of your loosely associated friends got married and you had absolutely no idea <laughs> but um, it's perfectly fine for me I don't really mind it because like I said you know I know what I need to do to change it and I'm not willing to do so because I just don't give a fuck like that I never have maybe there's some past trauma there associated with it I'm not really too sure um, I always mention that story of when I was talking and that boy Thomas essentially didn't want to be my friend anymore he was my friend for a while and then some new kid you know moved into the area who was my neighbor and then suddenly Thomas you know went to be the friend of that other kid and not me I was like oh shit and then suddenly you know I went to try and meet them and every time I went to meet them they weren't where they're meant to be and then one day I bumped into them where they were and they basically said down categorically hey we don't want to be your friend anymore and it's like oh and that, and that hurts more than anything. That hurts more than relationship breakups. I don't give a fuck. That hurts more than some girl turning you down. Like that hurts way more than somebody saying, hey, I don't want to be your friend anymore. It's even worse when they were your friend. They were cool with you. You had your ha-ha hee-hees. And then they said, you know what? From now on, don't talk to me. That hurts. <laughs> so I think maybe there's some past registry with that going on there. I'm not really too sure. But either way, um, I'm okay with it. It is what it is. I'm not going to change it now. And you have to just be okay with the fact that 
you know, all the decisions I made all those years ago are now starting to manifest in these sort of ways. So if I bump into these guys and stuff, IRL, you know, it's going to be as awkward as it always has been, you know, because, you know, I, I just can't fake the funk. I'm not someone that's going to be like, hi, wow. I mean, but, you know, it kind of is what it is. We've kind of all gone through our lives now doing what we're doing. What can you do? It is what it is. But, um, yeah, if you're a young lad, you're out there and you're a loner like me, just be very aware, be very careful about what you wish for because sometime along the line you may decide you want to change and not be like me and you want to have friends. So you need to make sure that you turn up and show up for your friends when you when they need you the most when you're younger for that innocuous stuff like going to the shop to return something hanging out wasting time meeting them there dropping them off here all those things are really important in terms of establishing and maintaining a friendship and being there for somebody because if you're not eventually they're gonna know they can't count on you but you know what do i know when it comes to that sort of stuff because i have no friends what do i know anyway moving on about people that have no friends i definitely <laughs> laughed a lot when i saw this clip of dj academics ranting and raving at the fact that all these industry people like charlemagne gillian wallow and stuff haven't necessarily um what you call it reciprocated the love that he's shown to them because i guess for whatever reason academics you know as much as i like the guy he's a very strange dude because i felt like in my impression of him, he's always been a bit of a dork, always been a bit of an outcast, always been a bit of a quote-unquote loser. Then he finally found his way, finally found his lane by streaming and having a very successful blog, um, Instagram page where he spoke, speaks about urban news and culture and hip-hop and all that stuff. So he does amazingly well there. He signs deals, signed with Rumble, Spotify podcasts like Millionaire, all that good stuff. So he finally kind of made his little lane. And obviously with the changing nature of hip hop and it being more acceptable to not just be a certain type of person who listens to hip hop, right? You don't have to be street. You don't have to be hood. You don't have to grow up in a certain area or grow up in a certain time. You can be 100% yourself and still be somewhat accepted in the industry and the scene. So, you know, you'd think you'd be happy with that. But for some reason, maybe it's because of his age, because he's weirdly in that kind of weird in-between bit of being a millennial and being a Gen Z kid age-wise. Maybe because of that, he kind of always has this, it feels like weird deep down desire of being accepted by the gatekeepers. He wants to have the kind of acceptance and approval of the OGs, like the Gillian Wallow, like the Charlemagne's and stuff, those older generation type people, when really I shouldn't think he should matter. It should matter to him. And he should also, I think, in my opinion, be um, aware that he's never going to get it from them because he's not cool right he's a bit of a dork like they're always going to see him as a bit of a lame because of how he talks about street politics because of how he talks about certain people's music because of just how he carries himself he's never going to be looked at as somebody like those people would actually like or want to spend any amount of time with so i'm surprised that he's surprised that they don't want to you know be friendly and pally pally with him in that way but i also think this is a further example of just how transactional industry relationships are and you have to realize that very very quickly i realized that very quickly when i was in the streetwear scene and the fashion scene that usually is always about what you can do for somebody it's never really about the love and about them being friends of you or liking you it's usually what can you do for that person and if you can build some love and relationships out of that then fair enough but you should never mistake in somebody's you know affection for you or love for you in the scene as it being real it's always because of something you can do for them and remember you can't do something for them it kind of goes away so you have to be very clear for the beginning of what you're expecting from this relationship so if they ask you for a favor you have to make sure that you pluck up the courage to say hey i want this in return for this i'm giving you and not think everything is done on strength and love but let's play the clip anyway with DJ academics ranting and raving a uh, feeling like the people that he would do anything for are also not willing to come on his podcast or create content with him or whatever maybe no nah, nigga i just had to get on my chest i ain't gonna lie to you it ain't sit right with me it ain't sit right that I've been scheduling with some people for a year. Then I've been asking another nigga for like mad long. But he got a hater on his shit. I, I'm looking like, oh, we not showing love. It's not mutual over here. If it's not mutual, just say this shit. But don't, we not finna do the not mutual shit in private because I was a nigga who was a fan of everybody, including John. By the way, no one's going to not say it's not mutual in public. They're not going to say it outright. No one ever does that. 
you know, very rarely do people even tell you they're not going to be friends with you anymore. They just stop texting you back. They just stop being there for you. They'd stop being maybe even, you know, you, you stop being able to maybe communicate with them. They might even block you for some reason. Do you know what I mean? So that never, ever happens. You just have to kind of read the signs and be grown up enough to accept some, no, be grown up enough to, or mature enough actually, to just accept their decision, regardless of if you think it's ill-informed and just move accordingly. So, I was a nigga who was a fan of y'all before I got in this. At this point, I'm looking like, man, if niggas don't respect what I got going on, man, fuck what y'all got going on too. We could, I ain't, it really ain't like that, but I ain't ducking no smoke from nobody. We could all get into it. It should always be like that. Even if you like what that person does, it should always be done from like an arm's distance. It should never be done from, oh, I love everything that you do in the hopes that my love is going to show you that I'm your friend and I'm going to get something from you. It should always be done from, yeah, I like what you do, but you just stay over there type of vibe. Yo, yo WAP 2324, fuck you, nigga. You say, yo, act. Yeah, you ain't sitting right with me neither. Nah, nigga, I... I ain't gonna lie, we gotta blip. This was sponsored by the Casamigos this morning at 8 a.m. Yeah, I just wanna know. I don't even want Charlemagne to even have no conversation with no more haters about me without him addressing why he ain't been on my podcast. When I did Brilliant Idiots, like years ago, when I did Breakfast Club months ago, by the way, over a million views, both of them. You see, the difference with, like, shows, that's why I knew this shit was going to happen. Nigga, I did show shit, show say, yo, let me know. Nigga, I'm going to do your shit. Nigga, he been done it. I think he did, like, once or twice. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. But at least reciprocity. You feel me? Probably fucked up that word. Alcohol is a hell of a drug. Now we don't fuck about nothing. But that's what I realized, too, in my little corner of the internet. I very rarely reach out to anybody. I think I can count on maybe one hand. But I'm also somebody that doesn't take stuff personally. So if somebody leaves me on scene or anything, it kind of is what it is. But I'm also aware that it's only because of the sort of quote unquote level that I'm at. The moment I start to progress and get a little bit bigger, have a little bit more quote unquote fame, a little bit more viewership, things like that will change. And those people will probably double back and start saying, hey, you know, sorry, I missed this, you know, seven years later or whatever, maybe. And you don't hold that against them. It just kind of is what it is. It's the nature of the game sort of thing. I'm not really that bothered or perturbed by it. But you should never go into it thinking it's like a love thing. It's a vibe thing. It's never that. It's always transactional. What can you do for them? What can they do for you? And sometimes the balance is a little bit skewed in their favor. Sometimes it comes back in your favor. And when it does, you use it to your advantage. And if it does, if you don't want to, you don't want to. Y'all niggas can take it however you want. And also, I feel... Y'all could put it, print it, do anything with it. Nigga. I feel a way that Gillian Wallow ain't been on my shit either. The fuck? Nigga, y'all use my studio. It wasn't that hard once Wack connected the numbers. I said, yo, come here, do this. Y'all can shoot my shit. I will, we could record if he, whatever. All right, nigga, I don't care how big y'all think y'all are now, nigga. It's, my t it's a swap. Like, what's up? Okay, I'm going to wait till All-Star Game. Okay, I'm going to wait till this. Okay, y'all free? Okay. Are y'all ever going to be? Hey. Man, I see them interviewing bum ass things. I'm like, man, this is crazy. So basically, in conclusion, what we know now is that he's always wanted the approval of the industry. As much as he likes to talk about chat niggas and carving his own lane, doing it on his own, which I think is super commendable to come in and essentially rewrite the media playbook in hip-hop nonetheless and essentially do away with the old guard completely because i detest and hate some of these hip-hop gatekeeper types like the ebros and paul rosenbergs and all these kind of up their own ass dickheads and stuff right i fucking hate them so the fact that someone like a academics who is incredibly uncool incredibly dorky incredibly lame but has found out a way to be very successful in that avenue and he pisses those guys off i'm always going to root for him and i think that's something to kind of hold up you know as an achievement and be very proud of but for some reason it's not enough he still wants the approval of the kind of og 
you know gatekeeper type of people and to have their somewhat approval when it's never going to come because they kind of you know maybe move a certain way have a different outlook on life and maybe just essentially just never seen him as a cool guy they always kind of see him somebody that they kind of need to put up with because he's one of the biggest platforms in the you know in the scene and not somebody they actually respect and it's something that also i don't think academics realizes i think as much as people like myself do actually respect his hustle and his grind i think there's some people out there that just accept that he's a necessary evil they don't even they're not even happy that he's in the industry and the moment he kind of wanes or he goes down a bit or they can remind him of where what they think of him they'll do it and they're obviously doing it by what he's is describing they're asking to use his studio to record other guests but then they're not agreeing to do his podcast in that same studio <laughs> you know that's the clearest example you can tell of somebody not fucking with you in the slightest they're okay to ask for favors to get something from you but if you want something from them they completely go ghost so he needs to realize that quickly that it's always going to be like that because he's not really the coolest guy in the world really and, and it kind of is what it is really to be honest but it's also an industry thing where relationships are never really what you, they seem they're always transactional and the quicker you realize it the better for you talking about transactional <laughs> nothing to do with transactional actually there's actually a really cool article um courtesy of town and country regarding the joy of traveling solo and i think this is a really good article because if i'm not mistaken it's actually written by the guy who originally wrote the book um call me by a name is based on um andre Asiman or andre ackman andre Asiman, um and it's called um, gr- the subtitle is group trips are grand but sometimes there's nothing better than being in a new place alone and i love this article because i think it does a really good um it's really good in terms of how it describes the joys of solo traveling while also being in a group and it just kind of compares and contrasts the different ways that you can enjoy holidays the sort of itemized checklist off approach to holidays is probably not the way that i like to approach things i've always kind of approached solo holidays because you know my yeah because i just don't have a big group of friends so i've just had to do it by default but also when i do go out i'd much rather go into the direction generally of where these checkmark landmarks sightseeing museum places are because most likely in that area you're going to find other things of interest if you just walk around but you don't need to walk and have a list of things to check off i don't really a fan of that because it kind of makes it a little bit rigid it kind of makes it a little bit cold you don't really experience the places you're in and i like to kind of wonder and discover things and get lost and stuff it's quite fun to do so so it's really the article anyway because i think it's a really really well written piece i love this piece of artwork here at the top as well um, which is done by a person called Constantine Kakanias. Um, but anyway, let's read the article. It says, traveling is not the same for everyone. We are never the same person twice in one day. So how could we have the same taste as others? I like Rome. My wife likes, likes London. My friends like Los Angeles, with whom we like traveling, prefer travel at Paris. They like to book tickets to museums, like to reserve tables at restaurants, while I've always avoided programmed itineraries of any sort. What we share, though, is wanting something that only travel can offer, and that occurs once we elsewhere and alternate holds um, onto things. A different pair of lenses. What is it exactly? Is it something we seldom disclose to others because we're not quite sure we can fathom it ourselves? Maybe this is why we travel, though. We give it many names. For me, it came in focus one day in in Ovetio, north of Rome. My wife is sleeping in late. She likes to do that when we travel. I don't. I like to get up before anyone else does and amble down the narrow cobble lanes of whatever small town we're visiting. I like to improvise my walks and hear people greet each other in the mornings. I like to make shift pleasantries from bakeries to pharmacists, newspaper vendors, and I don't mind getting lost. That's something I've discovered that I've started doing quite often as well. When I go on my little solo trips, I tend to not use my headphones. I tend to not have glasses on and stuff just because I want to just, you know, you know, immerse myself in the current location that I'm in and just take in the sights and sounds of what I'm kind of listening to, even sometimes on nights out, which is quite brutal. Um, if I'm especially if I'm going to a place like Berlin, for instance, where maybe you might be waiting in the queue for a stretch of time, not having any headphones can be a little bit of a, a little bit hard to kind of you know get a wrangle your head around but it's actually quite nice for a change to hear these different accents different voices different sounds and to really kind of ingratiate yourself in the environment that you're in 
personally. But again, what do I know? It continues the article. It says, I've already read up a bit on Ovetio Wines. I know a few things about the Cathedral, El Duomo, and about Teatro Mancinelli, the scaled-down but lavish opera house. I've learned about the tunnels dug other than the impregnable rock over which Ovetio was originally built. I don't like tunnels and will most likely sit quietly by myself while they all visit the cities underground. This morning, I proposed to meet one of my friends early in the cafe located on the left of the Duomo, which, as I learned from her, was admired by none other than John Ruskin and Charles Eliot Norton. She's late, is, she's late arriving, so while I wait, I order a cornetto and a cafe latte. All but one other table is occupied, and a man sitting in the shadow of the meagre hedge bordering the cafe is quietly reading his paper something I suspect he's been doing every morning this for years. Um, occasionally I hear it rustle when he turns a page or when the flimsiest draft floods through it. Otherwise, not a ripple in this placid sunlit square. That's something also you learn when you go to Mediterranean countries. Um, you have to get out super early if you want to grab a table at any cafe. Usually people sit at those tables for long stretches of time without maybe ordering much. There is no culture of like, oh, hurry up and get off the table to get someone else a table to sit down and eat. You know, it's, it's basically a first come, first served affair. They sometimes will hold tables and spots for other people who are going to come later down, you know, around the day. So if you don't find a seat somewhere, you're better off looking for another restaurant. Don't wait for somebody to get off of their seat because they're never going to stand up. They're going to be there until the very, very, very late evenings. It continues here. It says, this is a soundless hour. And and it exists in small windows in Italy. Everyone respects it. Soundless hour. Imagine this. So amazing to hear this. No cell phones, no dogs, no babies, no tourists. All these show up, but not just yet. It's Saturday and the people of Ovetio are not in any haste this morning. And that must be true of any major popular city, right? There must be hours of the day where you can especially go if you're a local and just chill and not have, not be worried that it's going to be, you know, hordes of tourists fluttering around making noise and being flipping disruptive or just you know spoiling the vibes there is a really set amount of time that you could go out there and kind of enjoy your little town your little city just for yourself and with the other locals or people that live there the carpenter who seems to be a direct descendant of medieval guild members stands outside his shop with a lit cigarette which he clearly doesn't want to put out and which gives him the thoughtful meditative air of an Italian Einstein still working on a theory of relativity. He hesitates and he's not indifferent to the stillness, no saws yet, no hammers, no fudding away, no drills or hand cranks or the raspy clatter of his rolling shutters. I love the stunning silence in the morning air here. I, an elderly man, hobbles by, not respectfully in my direction. I nod back, not a word. Someone is sweeping litter from the curbside. I can barely hear his broom, but I miss it when he walks away to another spot on the piazza. Silence. And that's something you learn to love when you go to these different places. The silence, um, the noise, but just the hearing of different things and not being on your phone consistently. And maybe this is kind of uh an article that kind of says without saying you know social media might have ruined holidays and vacations or just smartphones in general which i can kind of agree but i still think that, that that puts way too much um importance or responsibility on the phones and the apps and not enough responsibility on yourself i've done you know many things myself when i go on these little techno tourist you know weekenders where sometimes i will never use my phone when i'm out and about like socially or to post stuff i'm not posting every update of my holiday and vacation on instagram stories I'm not flipping tweeting. I'm not checking the news or whatever. I'm just enjoying where I am. I'm using my phone to kind of navigate maps. I'm using it to check out things I want to see on the internet, but I'm not doing anything else on it in terms of social media things. And I think you can do that easily at restaurants. You can just, you know, have your phone in your pocket, not on a table, in your actual pocket, and actually learn to observe people, people watch, sit in your own thoughts, maybe read a book, read a paper, and just chill. It's something that takes time, but it is possible. Um, even in this day and age where people's attention spans are horrible and you need the, you need a dopamine hit of some sort of notification and stuff, you can do it. It just takes a lot of effort to do so, but it is possible. It continues. As I wait to hear the, dis the distant clink of a spoon on the saucer, and sure enough, the waiter appears with a cornetto and a cafe latte and a um, de regu glass of water. Um, I just wait. I can't wait to devour the cornetto. 
and right away before he has a chance to disappear behind the beaded curtain i ask him to bring me another if my friend arrives i'll say i ordered it for her if she doesn't eat it i'll eat it maybe this is why i begin to hope that she won't arrive just yet i don't mind the wait and welcome another t- for five to ten minutes without anyone and this is actually the beauty of being on group holiday sometimes with people or just even with your partner because essentially sometimes you can find little pockets of time to just enjoy and do what you want like i used to do it sometimes as well before like you just wake up early and just go for a little walk if you just want to get some quote-unquote alone time and to kind of center yourself in the city you know you're in or do the things that you actually enjoy doing like getting a cafe coffee, coffee in the morning or getting some breakfast because some people just would rather lie in and get something on the way out and continues says being alone is an excuse for doing nothing and doing nothing um sorry let's say let's read that again i love that being alone is an excuse for doing nothing and doing nothing like yielding to Ovetio's mornings is exactly what i seek once i'm no longer tethered to my chaotic day-to-day life in new york people think travel is about seeing new things not for me i'm here for something that has almost nothing to do with sites monuments museums restaurants or nature or even people and their customs what i'm looking for is more than outside of me it's just that sitting at a cafe allows me to stop at time and to descend it and to dispel my thoughts and indulge in the errors of something unusual i love that line here this guy's definitely a writer what i'm looking for is more in me than outside of me just as sitting in this cafe allows me not to stop time but to distend it to dispel all my thoughts and to indulge in the errors of something unusual i want to forget time i don't like time when was time ever my friend i don't ever want um ovetio to give me something new what I want maybe is to be given something back, some intangible something I believe I once cradled but I lost track of and can scarcely remember. I'll eventually take pictures of the Domo and of the old Ovetio, but it's a picture of the little cafe with a meager hedge which separates it from the cafe across the way that I'll treasure. This I'll remember. This is where I waited for a friend and suddenly caught a glimpse of the big paradox that defines my life, that I have always dreaded loneliness, but I love being left alone, which is why I, why I like waiting for my friend. I don't mind if she's late. I want to show her the picture of what Ovetio means to me, a table, a cafe latte, a second cornetto waiting to be eaten into, to bitterness you, sorry, and my half-emptied Becerra de Aqua. Now, I can definitely agree with this being an, you know, an extrovert, introvert. I wouldn't say that I kind of dread being alone. Um, I still think there is something beautiful in being able to enjoy your own company, especially in a solo trips. And I think you really are doing yourself a disservice if all your holidays have to be prerequisited and defined by your ability to go somewhere with other people like you can't go on trips places because other people don't agree um i've heard from friends and other people associates of how difficult it can be to get groups of people to agree to go on these holidays and whatnot even just to agree to go on dinner so i can't imagine how hard it is to wrangle a group of adults to decide to go on holiday together so if you're able to enjoy your own company and you don't mind going on trips it does allow you the ability to see far-flung places that maybe some of your friends wouldn't enjoy going to and sometimes i've notice for some people if they see you having the courage to go on your own and hang out maybe it gives them the courage to actually hang out and go with you because some people actually are weird where they actually need to go on holidays with more than one person they they don't feel comfortable just going on holiday with you alone but if you share pictures of yourself in this amazing place on your own in some fucking amazing beach somewhere in the middle of fucking thailand then suddenly they also want to go so it can be quite a motivational factor if you're able to do so but i thought this line was absolutely incredible this is i remember as I waited for my friend and suddenly caught a glimpse of the big proudest moment to find my life that I always dreaded loneliness but I love being left alone that's a great little line in it I mean, continues, I know I'll be thrilled to see her again and I know we'll laugh as we always do I know we'll spend a long time studying the cathedral this morning because she likes to spend time in churches and I love to hear her tell me things I'm glad to learn from uh, I learn from her at some point she'll ask me what's new walking with my hands in my pockets I remember the carpenter dawdling um, outside his store and I'll finally tell her that sitting for breakfast and waiting for her reminded me that I travelled thousands of miles to bask under the invisible spell of that one rare thing in our lives plentitude i felt richer that morning than i'd felt in any long time why she'll ask because i want for nothing here why leave then why indeed neither of us wants to answer this question but we know the answer part of us wants to stay here and never go back another part thank heaven refuses to think of this through and i think that end bit is really poignant because it kind of reminds me of one of the paragraphs i'm reading in the tim ferris book i think it might have been four hour work week where he basically says 
you know the part of you know the beauty of vacationing and holidaying is that it's sort of like an adult way of treating yourself in terms of your toiling most of the year and then you have these short breaks in you know spread out across the year where you get a chance to kind of disconnect and unwind which is why you're meant to do absolutely no work when you go to vacation you're meant to be working your ass off you know for however long you want six months a year and then once that time is over, you can take some time off to kind of do what you need to be done. Put your feet up, enjoy some sun and, you know, get a tan and whatever it may be. Um, but you shouldn't be on like a permanent vacation because it takes the beauty out of vacationing. And it also makes it a little bit dull. You know, also it might help if you're maybe have, you know, if you're not super rich because you, can, you can't do everything. If, you're, if you've got all the money in the world, maybe holidays become a bit boring because you can do whatever you want maybe having a, a particular budget is really important but i think it's more so important for me personally from what i've been able to see and observe from people to be able to just have these short breaks spread out across the year and not have them be things that you do all the flipping time because then it makes it something that you actually appreciate something you look forward to and something that you kind of savor when you're there in the moment and the last thing you want to do is kind of copy and you know uh, the same habits that you have at home that bum you out like always being on your phone like always uploading stuff on ig like checking stuff and all that monarchy you just want to actually do the complete opposite and i found that i do that more often when i'm abroad as well but i guess it depends on the person that you are but this article is absolutely amazing incredibly well written of course um the courtesy of town and country mag.com the title is the joy of traveling solo group tips are grand but sometimes there's nothing better than being in a new place alone written by andre Asiman, the flipping original author of the book of what the movie a calling by your name was based on so definitely check it out if you haven't already but i'll put the link in the show notes or description if you haven't checked it out yourself it's a really good article really really did enjoy it very 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 well done then to quickly close this episode actually unfortunately this is some really tragic news to kind of put out there something i've not seen being pushed out on the timeline maybe because people are afraid of talking about it because it might lead to the overall closure of the club but i think this is probably on the cards now considering how many occurrences of this that they've had over the years and close shaves this is coach of daily mail it says police probe death at fabric nightclub here in london after a man in his first collapse at notorious london club um in the early mornings so a man in his 30s sadly died Died after being collapsing at notorious London club fabric police were called um, to the medical emergency shortly after 2 a.m. on a Sunday despite efforts to resuscitate the man he tragically died um, so which is awful to see that right and um, it continues here it says officers attended the man is first received medical treatment upon arrival despite our best efforts to resuscitate him he was pronounced dead at 2 11 um, the death is being treated as unexpected at this early stage. Inquiries are ongoing. The coroner has been informed and officers in the process of tracing his next of kin. One club has said the club suddenly closed and everyone was escorted out. Later, the door staff said someone had died and nobody was allowed near the club. We were all called at 1.22 a.m. on Sunday, the 25th of June to report to a person on World Fabric Club. Duh, 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 duh. We sent a number of resources there. Unfortunately, despite best efforts, a person was pronounced dead at the club. And it also ends here. The Poppy Night Club was forced to close back in September 2016 in the wake of two drug-related deaths. There are two deaths in 2016 in there. It's also revoked after council found it to be a culture of drug use. However, the Farringdon Club was allowed to reopen in 2017 after parties agreed to a new licensing condition, including raised in entry age and tougher security measures. Um, conditions included um, anyone under 19 was entering the venue. Was continued there at 8 p.m. on Monday. The club also pledged to introduce a new ID scanning system issued on entry and to improve search procedures, which is also something they've done over the years. And it's quite tragic because obviously they've tried everything in their power to reinvent fabric over the years. It's just never going to be a safe place in general. I think most clubs can't promise that anyway, but fabric more so than most because of the crowd it attracts because of the uh, vibe it basically cultivates on the inside because of the flipping horrible precedent it sets itself on the beginning of the club it's probably one of the most horrible experiences in terms of going in the nightclub i've ever experienced especially for just a normal punter the amount of security checks you go through they're very intrusive um they're very off-putting even just where you have to place your flipping jacket you have to go up some stairs it feels like you're getting flipping booked into a prison or something how you have to put your jacket in and go up another stairs and go down and then this whatever it's just a horrible experience once you get on the actual dance floor themselves you get into actual rooms they're absolutely splendid 
probably two of the best rooms you're ever going to see, ever going to hear in the UK once it comes to nightclubs and stuff. Absolutely incredible. But anything outside of that is absolutely horrible. Really, really, really horrible. Um, and it's really strange because there are people on the dance floor, security guards with flashlights that shine lights on you if they feel you're acting a bit dodgy and shit to dissuade people from doing drugs. But I've still seen people taking massive lines, massive key bumps, doing fucking balloons on the flipping fabric dance floor, which is insane because you're wondering how the fuck did they get the fucking helium inside the club considering how extensive the searches are they empty all your pockets they put stuff in pots they fucking inspect the stuff that's in pots they search all your inside they search around your fucking you know your trousers um they do on your inside of your leg your socks sometimes you'll have to take your shoe off it's crazy how much to do it before in the past they used to have fucking sniffer dogs in that nightclub which I'm sure permanently damaged this view with some people regardless. And it kind of makes me think back to that YouTube channel that I've been watching quite often now called Das Techno Team. These two guys from Berlin who really pontificate and it's, if anything, maybe take themselves a bit too seriously when it comes to club culture. But now I kind of understand why, because there are some places that they take themselves seriously because there is a serious approach to club culture. It's a serious approach to harm reduction and there's a serious approach to making sure people are safe in clubs regardless and that's why when they don't recognize it in some places they raise the alarm so that things can be you know so people are aware and things can change because the consequences can be completely lethal and it is quite interesting to see that the clubs in london that don't have any kind of door selection policy type thing which is usually something that annoys a lot of people who don't get into these clubs in berlin are also the clubs that tend to have the most issues right i think of places like egg i think of places like fabric where essentially if you have money you can go in they usually have the most issues there are places where you're going to see the most fights the most whatever and i've even been in fabric myself maybe as of the last six months and seen somebody collapse um on the dance floor from you know maybe taking too much k or whatever they were taking ambulance came in they didn't end the night they treated him on the dance floor he woke up they took him outside and stuff but i've seen that like that's a regular occurrence that happens there i'm sure security probably will probably tell you that but then they have this extensive searching and stuff but that still happens so clearly there's a culture around that club that just permeates through and bleeds into the patrons who kind of copy what goes on there because i feel like a lot of those behaviors i saw some people learn based on the vibe the club kind of emits and puts out there so it's unfortunate for this young gentleman in his 30s that he had to be a victim of such a thing because you would imagine going to a nightclub you know it's an amazing experience you go there to enjoy yourself you go to have a great time the last thing you're gonna think is gonna happen is that you might pass away there from maybe doing too much or taking dodgy stuff or whatever it may be who knows what the circumstances are around it but it does really leave a horrible stain on a club like fabric and obviously just paints a horrible light on how we treat nightlife in london and the uk overall there has to be a lot of kind of self-reflection on this sort of stuff about how us as brits just don't know how to maybe rave responsibly there is maybe something to be said for that maybe fabric aren't to blame at all maybe it's the patrons that go into the club just don't know how to behave don't know how to act and always do the most which inevitably leads to people you know succumbing to things like collapsing and whatnot in flipping clubs because they've taken too much which is obviously completely tragic but this feels like this might be the beginning of the end and again they have no one else to blame but themselves because i felt like over the years uh, no matter how much paint they've tried to place on that club new stances new whatever i don't feel like there's been a real onus on cultivating community on trying to rewrite restart the club from a new it's just been putting plasters on an open wound and this essentially is what you get when you don't take stuff like that seriously which is why we have to thank the clubs that do take those type of things seriously that maybe do have promoters in place who you know stipulate that only a certain type of person can come into their spaces and whatnot um because this is what leads at least to a somewhat safer raving experience which i don't think is the case but i think that does add to it in some regards it does kind of dissuade some people from doing some madnesses because they know um, the people behind it are definitely on job and know what they're flipping doing but man my thoughts and feelings go out to the kid or the guy that passed away 30 years old there's no age to die especially in the flipping nightclub i can't imagine what his family and friends are going through um it's probably completely tragic again you leave your you know you, you get notified your person's going out for a night out to party the last thing you think is going to happen is they're going to arrive back in a body bag or something like absolutely horrible so rip to the person who passed away and also to the people who had to witness that it would in 
firsthand, you know, imagine what a vibe killer that is. You're just rolling, you're just coming up, you're just coming down and you see someone claps and, you know, as humans, I think we can usually intrinsically tell when somebody has passed, we can just see it in their lifeless body. We can just get a sense of something has happened here where they pass up into the other realm. And this is what happened to this person. So RIP to them. Um, hopefully we get to a resolution with this. I'd love to see some sort of conflict resolution. This also to meet in between from the council and the club but i feel like with the amount of strikes fabric have had over the years it just feels like this might be the final nail on the coffin for them where they might eventually have to close for good because you just can't have people you know regularly dying um at your club um all the time and just point it down to people getting too crazy and doing dodgy drugs because clearly they are attracting these type of people in their club in the first place that's the major part of contention that i would have if i was a local council person like why is it that fabric seems to be the only first place that attracts place people who tend to go too hard too crazy and do too much and then end up having to pass away at a flipping nightclub it just doesn't make any sense but like i said plenty of times myself as many times if i tried to give the club a chance it is a bit of a dump um the sound system's great they got great great get book it they great they get great book into the stuff but there's people that go in it just make it a horrible place to go and hang out which is really i think a bit of a slight on the club because like i said great location great history great lineup but the scene the people that hang out there it just doesn't make it seem worthwhile to put yourself through all that nonsense the security the checks everything just ruins your night to the point where you're thinking you know what i'd much rather be at home or i'd much rather watching a fucking set on boiler room or something so i can't blame people for feeling like that at all but r.i.p to the victims um hopefully the family are getting the support they need and we'll see how this plays out with fabric but this is not a good sign for them going forward this is not a good sign for them going forward anyway that has been the Exynos English Show episode number 688. Hopefully you have enjoyed the show so far. I really do hope you have. If it's your first time checking out the show, make sure you know what to do. Click the links all down below in the description to check out the stuff that I do. That'd be greatly appreciated. And yeah, man, if you listen to the audio side of the podcast, you will hear a tune of the day popping if popping in underneath my voice as i'm speaking popping in popping on popping in popping under um very soon and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace